Schreiber. Hi everyone, I'm sorry, I'm having some connectivity issues, but here I am. My name is Carolina Chavez and I'm broadcasting live from Miami. Today is Wednesday, June 10th of 2020. Okay, so um, I just wanna say something before we start. I'm learning uh, about all, all of these events that are happening right now. I'm learning about the African-American community so um, if I say something that is not necessarily appropriate, please let me know. I'm on a learning process and I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, also, I have a lot of information here. At the end of the, the broadcast, you will see uh, many of the sources that I used. If you have some information that's different from what I am um, sharing with you, please also let me know. So. Uh, due to the re recent events related to the death of uh, George Floyd, the protests and the cry for reform from the black community and an immense array of support that has emerged from all over the world, I came across a very distinctive circumstance that is happening in front of our eyes, but it is ve very well kept under the sheets. Uh, just as one more factor of um, inequality and discrimination and uh, racism related to the African-American community and the fashion industry. And this is uh, prison labor. So I'm going to build a, um, a background of how the system works and then so we can we can build up on it and we uh, so we can understand better uh, how this is related to the fashion industry and why this is also so uh, deep and delicate okay so just in the US um, 25 percent of the world's prisoners are here in the United States between 1980 and 2015, the number of incarcerated women increased by 750%, okay? Rising from a total of 2,600,000 uh, around in 1980 to, to um, 225 uh, in 2017. The prison labor in the United States is worth around $2 billion per year. 95% of inmates will be released in the future, but two-thirds of these prisoners, of these people, will um, <clears throat> be rearrested within three years. They have no labor rights. 70% of children that have parents that are in prison are likely to go to prison too. The spending on prisons and jails has increased at triple the rate, this is, this is incredible, of the spending on pre-K to 12th grade public education in the last 30 years. We spend more on prisons than in education. So this is uh, a general aspect, very general aspect of, uh, of the system here in the United States. Now we're going to talk about the African-American community. Um, the African-Americans uh, are, are incar incarcerated at more than five times the rate of whites. The imprisonment rate of African-American women is twice as white women. This is different from the Latin American community, okay? It's different um, here in the United States, is measured differently. The imprisonment rate for African American, no, I'm sorry, um, yeah, the, about the women. White men with a criminal record are more likely to get a job, uh, a job interview, than black men with no criminal record. Having a record reduces the likelihood of a job callback or a job interview or a job offer as much as 50%. The reduced unemployment for the millions of people with records cost the United States from 70 to 78 to 87 billion dollars each year. 
The United States Census reports that each in each of these uh, southern states, Texas, Florida, Georgia, North Carolina, Maryland, Louisiana, Virginia, South Carolina, Alabama, and Mississippi, more than one million people are reported uh, the, to belong to the black community. Now, I'm, I'm saying this just to see the relation between the states with the greater population of African American and the states with tougher laws and the states with more imprisonment, so we can see a little bit of the relationship. So the 10 states with the highest incarceration rates are Georgia, Kentucky, Missouri, Texas, Alabama, Arkansas, Arizona, Mississippi, Oklahoma, and Louisiana. So uh, they calculate uh, for different type of offenses, like drug-related offenses, Iowa ranks the highest um, <clears throat> in time of incarceration, okay? The highest incarceration rates. Louisiana, and then uh, Tennessee, South Carolina, Minnesota, and Hawaii comes, come next. For immigration-related crimes, states uh, were very fairly... Uh, you know, they're, they're kind of uh, similar overall, but Kentucky and New Jersey are um, the ones that, uh, for the, that, that are tied for the longest average sentence. Um, states that were generally harsher for crimes against, person, against a person are Virginia, ranking at the top, uh, followed by Texas, Minnesota, North Carolina, and Kentucky. And for white collar crimes, uh, received the longest sentences in Mississippi. Um, some of white collar crimes are um, wage theft, uh, fraud, bribery, Ponzi schemes, inside trading, labor racketeering, embezzlement, etc. Um, Peter McAllister, the executive director of the Ethical Trading Initiative, this is an alliance of companies and trade unions and non, non governmental organizations that bark workers' rights, he says that prison labor is very complicated and an opaque topic. On one hand, there are definitely uh, well-intentioned brands with rehabilitation programs like uh, in place doing some good work all over the world. On the other hand, there are big questions to be asked around whether inmates should ever form the mainstream production of a profit-driven label, particularly given how many unacceptable cases of prisoner exploitation exist deep in the global supply um, supply chain in the fashion industry. The biggest problem in stopping the export of products made in prison is that the supply lines are almost untraceable. Sometimes it happens that a company hires a factory to do the work, but then this factory hires labor from prisons, but the initial company that made you know the, the 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 those contracts they don't even know so this is why it's so complicated this is why i've been uh, expressing enough that uh why it's so important that the transpar the, the, the transparency throughout the supply chain it has so many um layers to it that you know it really makes complicated to know where everything is coming from and one of those places where your clothes are coming from are probably from prison labor. Um, the, the current pay leaves many prisoners struggling to afford even phone calls to their, to their family members or toothpaste and deodorant. Even years after hard work inside, they frequently have little or nothing saved uh, to help with rent or the necessities when they are released. If they were paid even something less than minimum wage, but some reasonable amount of money, they could get out and have at least, at least a little bit of money to get started. This, uh, this is a statement from Michelle Ditch, a senior lecturer at the University of Texas in Austin, who once served as a, a court-appointed monitor of that state's prison system. One of the very peculiar issues of the prison system is that whatever happens inside is very well kept inside, so uh, when riots or protests or hunger strikes or other types of manifestations arise, 
it's very difficult for the mainstream media to report in detail. They are reported. We can, if you if you Google, you will see things happening. But um, we don't we don't get a hold of that information as precise as it happens when you know when we're speaking about prisons. If I mean, right now we can almost see live whatever is happening with the protests and the and the looting and all that, but when it comes to prison, it's a whole other level of of, um, of information we have access to. So this makes it more complicated for the system to be clear and for the prisoners to have rights and, you know, all of that. Um, but the labor aspect, this is from counterpunch.org, they say the labor aspect of mass incarceration doesn't end there. People with a felony conviction carry a stigma, a brand often accompanied by exclusion from the labor market. Michelle Alexander, an ex-convict, um, she calls felon the new N-word. Indeed, in the, in the job world, those of us with felony convictions face a number of unique barriers. The most well-known is the box. That question on unemployment applications, which ask for criminal backgrounds. Now, she says that in 11 states and more than 40 cities and counties, they have outlawed the box of unemployment applications. Supporters of the ban box argue that questions about previous convictions amount to a form of racial discrimination, since such a disproportionate number of those with felony convictions are African American and Latinos. Advancing the bank box campaigns will have a far more important impact on incarcerated people as workers than pre uh, for workers than pressing for higher wages uh, for those under contract to big companies inside. All of this is not to deny that uh, big corporations have made huge amounts of money from mass incarceration. Firms like Arizona Kitchell Construction which has built more than 40 prisons, state prisons, and 30 adult jails have made millions. The Tennessee-based Bob Barker Enterprises is a household name among the, the incarcerated. With a corporate vision, listen to this, of transforming criminal justice by honoring God in all we do. Barker has reaped massive profits from producing the poorest quality consumer goods like two-inch um, toothbrushes for people behind bars. These, of course, uh, well, then, of course, we have uh, other private prison operators like CCA and GEO Group. And although they private, they, the privates control only 8% of prison beds nationally, these two firms managed to bring over $3 billion in revenue last year. This is two companies. Only 8% of prison beds, 3 billion in revenue last year. Uh, so there's two types of work or um, uh, two, not, not only two types of work, but two, two types. Uh, one is inside of the prison that includes uh, maintenance like cooking, janitorial, and uh, laundry, and the other one is outside, like working for companies, right? Um, uh, or factories to produce goods and services. So now we're gonna talk about a company, it's called Unicorn. This is the Federal Prison Industries Program um, that was established in 1934 by an executive order issued by President Franklin D. Roosevelt. On January 1st, 1935, it officially began operations as a wholly owned corporation of the United States government. 80 years after its establishment, the program continues to operate at no cost to taxpayers and benefits communities across the nation, creating safer prisons and reducing Emet recidivism. This is this information is what the company says they they do. Okay, so we gather some information from Prison Policy Initiative, and they report that um, 
the percent of able-bodied sentenced federal prisoners required to work is 100%. So everybody inside of a prison that is fully capable is required to work. Uh, the number of prisoners uh, that work in unicorn um, in the federal prison uh, industries is 22,560. The pay scale for federal prisoners who work for unicorn in prison um, maintenance in dollars per hour is 0.12 cents of a dollar to 0.40 cents of a dollar. Just to have a, a, a little bit of perspective, the minimum wage in Haiti is 0.30 cents of a dollar, okay? Uh, the minimum unicorn wage is 0.23 cents. The maximum minimum wage of unicorn is $1.15. cents. Um, the number of prisons where Unicorn makes clothing and textiles is 22. The average hourly earnings of a non-prisoner U.S. worker in a textile mill is 10.95. This is average, okay? We spoke a few weeks ago about uh, garment workers in LA and this is not the case at all, but in average. Um, Unico reported in sales in 2001 five, uh, 583 million dollars. The amount purchased from Unicor from the Department of Defense in 2001 was 388 million dollars. Uh, the amount purchased from the U.S. Postal Service from Unicor in 2001 21 million dollars, and um, in 2000, 2009 Unicor reported that they estimated they would hire around 2,100, 2,100, 2,100 workers. Um, so, another number that's interesting is the percent of unicor orders that are delivered late is 42 percent this is one of the reasons many companies cannot rely on labor that comes from prisons because if a riot happens if a hunger strike happens operations can stop from a day to a week to you know longer periods of time so it is very difficult to rely your whole operation of this uh, on this labor because you never know when these things are going to happen and when these things are going to go back to to normals to resume operations so <clears throat> that's one other aspect that's interesting uh, prisoners both men and women benefit tremendously from in prison jobs because it doesn't matter if they work uh, in maintenance or, in, or or outside of the prison but this is a form of rehabilitation this is a form of uh, for them to tackle the dehumanizing boredom that um, they experience I think we can relate a little bit to that, not even a little, but uh, we've been inside of our homes for months and uh, how does that feel? Now imagine in these conditions, uh, very, very, very extreme poor conditions, we don't even understand um, how, they, how they live, right? And with who they live and how they sleep and how they eat and everything. So it's very dehumanizing for them to be doing absolutely nothing the, the entire day. So that's why labor is so important, whether they do it for the prison or inside the prison or outside. It also uh, happen, uh, ha helps them to earn money so they can buy for, uh, for things inside of the prison. They can pay for phone calls or they can pay for deodorant, whatever things they need. And also uh, many of these prisoners have family outside. They're the breadwinners in some cases. So. Uh, this money that they can earn help uh, the families outside. They can learn skills and they also, you know, recover a little bit of that self-esteem that was that was probably broken at some point. Um, so work is really a vital aspect on on, on uh, against recidivism. Recidivism is the reincidence is is you know to try not to have them back again into the system. Um, over the past quarter century, there has been a profound change in the involvement of women within, within the criminal justice system. 
This is the result of more expansive law enforcement efforts, uh, the st uh, stiffer drug sentencing laws, we spoke about this, and post-conviction barriers to re-entry that uniquely affect women. The female incarcerated population stands nearly eight times higher than in 1980. More than 60% of women in state prisons have a child under the age of 18. This is as of June of 2019, uh, yes, 19, according to the sentencing project. Now, the, we have, uh, um, there's this company called Carcel, Carcel in Spanish is, is prison. It's a Danish brand. They, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read to you what they have on their web page as an explanation of what they do. They call themselves an ethical brand, okay? So it says, both socially and environmentally, we are pursuing a positive impact agenda. Founded in 2016, we produce clothing from natural materials sourced locally in the region of production, alpaca in Peru and uh, silk and lyocell in Thailand. They, they work with two prisons in these two countries. And they say that employees are mostly single mothers incarcerated for non-violent poverty related crimes. Uh, training and wages give them tools to reconnect with their families outside and remap their future. Every piece of carcel clothing is signed by its maker. So to make it, according to them, a little bit more ethical, they source locally, they uh, put the, uh, the names of the makers on their labels, etc., etc. But what's the problem here? Okay, and this is something that I, I want you to be very careful because we can hear again and again and again that uh, brands are doing the ethical thing, but we need to go deeper and we need to use our logic to see how, re how ethical their practices are, okay? Their system of this carcel brand is profiting on incarceration following in the footsteps of problematic prison labor practices in the U.S. and elsewhere. The entire model, model of operation is con, uh, contingent upon poor, desperate women continuing to be arrested and condemned for long sentences. They are taking advantage of, of, of you know, women being in prison, okay? And you would say, well, what's the problem if the, if the if the prison likes the project and they're giving women the, the chance to earn a living well, the system is driven by opportunism and profit and fueled by, po by poverty. Using prison labor is not a philanthropic, a philanthropic endeavor. They claim that they're giving women a fair wage in that, um, and that, way, that wage is associated with um, the livability but they use the minimum wage of their specific countries, okay? So it's, if Peru, if Peru, the living wage is certain amount of money, they pay them that certain amount of money, and the same in Thailand, and I mean, we just spoke about that, the Haiti being cents of a living wage. So that's not necessarily um, what they actually need, okay? Um, Carcel is primarily a luxury brand focused on making money. So using cheap labor of any kind to make expensive goods to sell to rich Western women and enrich other wealthy Western women isn't altruism. It's just capitalism is profiting from uh, very poor labor practices. And we've seen it all over the place. There's an owner that's rich and there's you know, the bottom of the chain that are completely left to their own devices and, and the system takes advantage of the situation again and again and again. Um, uh, Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, she is a marine biologist, a policy advisor and Brooklyn native, um, founder on, and CEO of the consultant, consultancy Ocean Collective, founder of the non-profit think tank Urban Ocean Lab and co-editor of the forthcoming anthology All We Can Save, 
Truth, Courage, and Solutions for the Climate Crisis. She wrote for the uh, Washington Post recently. Um, I invite you to read the whole article. Her name is Ayana Elizabeth Johnson. She wrote in response of um, everything that's happening. Basically what she's saying, and I will read to you some, uh, I, will, I will quote quote her, but basically what she's saying is that if the African-American community had the same rights as everybody else, they could be focused more on what really matters and not trying to fight over and over and over for their basic human rights, okay? So this is what she wrote. If we want to successfully address climate change, we need people of color, not just because pursuing diversity is a good thing to do, and not even because diversity leads to better decision making and more effective strategies, but because black people are significantly more concerned about climate change than white people.